back, we're going to start. Oh, there he is. Wonderful. And I've got a voice, um, uh, which means that I can say wonderful good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations on uh, not just having gotten out of bed, uh, but also brought your interest uh, and your knowledge sharing to us this morning. Uh, we are liking uh, the fact that uh, you are actually here. And we assume that uh, during the course of the next half an hour, more and more people will wander in. So third day of the International Transport uh, Forum, and uh, we're going to go into the middle of things. Um, this morning, we're actually going not just to talk about the new energy future, because um, it is not just new what we're going to be talking about, because uh, we're already on the way. Um, my name is Connie Schumach. I'm going to be uh, your host for the next hour and a half, and that gives me the time to actually sit down. I have a wonderful panel this morning, um, all extremely knowledgeable people. And uh, let me start uh, with a gentleman uh, from your point of view on the left. Um, uh, Bertrand Picard is... Um, so many things um, uh, right at the moment. Uh, he is probably best known for his absolutely fascinating enterprise to try and uh, circumnavigate this world with, an elect uh, with a solar-driven plane. And he'll be talking about that, but he'll be talking about um, the whole enterprise behind that and what it means uh, for driving a technology. Talking about driving a technology, Klaus Bonhoff on his left side uh, is the managing director of an organization called NOW. Um, first uh, interest of NOW is hydrogen and fuel cells. Um, you've been uh, on the road with NOW for the last six years now. 2008 it was founded, uh, Germany based, um, but of course with a glance to Europe uh, and the world. Um, the man on my right, uh, from your point of view uh, on my left, uh, Didier Hussein um, is going to be sort of um, our eagle's view. Uh, he is from the International Energy Agency. He's uh, been looking at uh, the alternative uh, fuels um, of both the present and the future, and he will give us an overview right at the beginning. Last but not least, no, that's wrong. Um, last but not least, the fuel that we're talking about is the electric energy, and these two people are concerned with this. One, as an analyst, um, that's Gunnar Lindberg on my left. Uh, he's from the Norwegian Institute of Transport Economics, even though he's a Swede, but I, um, I think, you know, that's uh, you're Nordic from uh, our point of view, uh, so uh, we can uh, go easy on that. Uh, by the way, uh, the next uh, gentleman, Sonnen McGrath, as a Chief Technology Officer of the Electricity Supply Board, ECARS in Ireland, and he's got also many, many other hats uh, to which we will come uh, in a moment. Um, so you actually have representatives uh, of uh, two countries where uh, cars driven by electricity um, are already on the way forward. Um, not the mainstay yet, uh, but they're sort of uh, giving us an example, which gives me the time uh, to turn to you, Didier. Um, originally, you wanted to sort of sort out uh, all the different alternative energy courses, um, um, uh, alternatively um, energy um, uh, sources, but now you said you actually want to sort of give an overview of the world. Um, look at the world in three to four minutes, and yes, that's your microphone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good morning everyone. Maybe maybe not, not just setting the scene in terms of what we do in the IEA. We, we've just, we, we produce long-term scenario to look at how a, a, a sustainable future is possible for energy and transport as a key role to play in that, uh, in that endeavor. Uh, why? Because uh, in all sectors, as you know, transport has the highest dependence on oil. This uh, dependence on oil is increasing, actually, and uh, because of the increase of uh, mob mobility worldwide. And 50% of the oil produced goes to the transport sector. So we need, in a sustainable future, to uh, decarbonize, including the transport sector, reduce, which will uh, at the same time reduce our oil dependency and improve energy security. On a business uh, as usual trajectory, um, the transport sec the global emissions from the uh, uh, transport sector is expected to increase over 70% by 2050 and, and puts us on a path beyond 4 degrees uh, Celsius climate uh, warming, global warming. 
in our two degrees uh, uh, scenario, which is uh, in line with the IPCC objectives, we need to stabilize transport uh, uh, consumption and emissions by 2020 and uh, cut it by nearly 30% by 2050. Uh, how we can do that through three main options, avoid unnecessary travel, shift travel to more efficient modes, alternative fuels, but also improve the energy efficiency uh, of each mode. Um, with um, avoid and shift measures, have the capacity to deliver improvement by uh, redistribution of uh, tr transport activity across different modes, and they can deliver 20% of greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2050. But we shouldn't forget about improved policies, which means using existing technologies uh, in all the transport system, which represent 50% of uh, emission reductions. So in our mobility model, we try to uh, evaluate all the measures that are needed to get to that two-degree scenarios. And they include a combination of uh, fuel efficiency standards, vehicle taxation, fuel taxation, road pricing, uh, and other measures. I'd like to insist that improved measures <coughs> represent 50% of abatements. Uh, the average fuel economy of car is improving uh, around 3% over the last years. Uh, now the trend is moving to 4% per, per year. And the Global Fuel Economy Initiative goal we participate in, in um, is to reduce fuel consumption per kilometer of cars uh, by 50% by uh, 2050. So this is equivalent to 50% uh, improvement for the fuel uh, consumption of new vehicles worldwide. <clears throat> so uh, this is in line with our uh, 2DS uh, uh, objective and what is important to note is that it would be achieved, such an objective would be achieved at low or even negative cost taking into account the fuel savings over the vehicle lifetime. So how we can do that through uh, in cha incremental changes to conventional inter internal combustion engines and drive system. Uh, along with uh, weight reduction and better uh, aerodynamics, of course. And at the same time, uh, increasing the share of hybrid, uh, hybrid vehicles um, across the board. Beyond the improvement of new cars, also there are measures to be taken to improve the uh, fuel efficient, the uh, efficiency of existing uh, of the entire uh, stock of cars uh, through uh, um, aftermarket products like uh, replacement tires, fuel efficiency, driving style, improving traffic and speed management, uh, man better maintenance of the vehicle and better management of mobility in cities. Having said that, there is a role for alternative uh, options, of course, that's very important in a 2DS scenarios. Uh, existing uh, car use uh, petrol, but uh, uh, engines as, as well as turbines for, uh, aero, uh, for airplanes uh, are suitable for a variety of different fuels. Uh, first, natural gas. Natural gas can be an option for long distance transport by road, especially where in regions where gas is abundant and cheap. But there is a big uh, issue is the, uh, you have a lot of infrastructure costs to put in place to develop uh, gas as a fuel option, uh, whereby at the same time it's not a, long, a sustainable option for the long term. It's more an option for the transition and you need to balance the cost in terms of infrastructure and the fact that in a 2DS scenario the role of gas should be limited because of course gas is also uh, emitting uh, uh, CO2. So in a, in, in a sort of medium scenario we would see the share of gas representing 5% of transport demand, but in a really low, co low, low carbon scenario, we wouldn't use gas. Biofuels have an important role to play also if the sustainability uh, um, issues are properly uh, addressed, and there are a variety of them. Uh, in our um, uh, scenario, they represent, uh, 2DS scenario, they represent 30% uh, of transport energy demand by 2050, uh, which is uh, uh, doubling from today's, uh, from today's level. And they could impediently play a role where other options for, for aviation, where uh, we will hear more about electricity in aviation, but, but, but uh, uh, clearly this is an, an option for aviation. And we see biofuels representing 40% of the total fuel demand uh, in, by 2050. There is also a, a huge prospect for um, electric vehicles uh, of different types, uh, uh, hybrid and plugging uh, electric vehicles that which are well, well suited 
to respond to very high uh, economy standards. Battery electric vehicles uh, also are, uh, will play a role, but they need adaptation for the, uh, the consumers. A new business model like car sharing system uh, will be very important to develop uh, uh, battery electric vehicles as well as the use of uh, um, ICT technologies. But still, the cost of uh, battery technology needs to be need to be cut and 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 arranged. Anxiety, anxiety issues need to be uh, tackled. So we see the role of electric vehicles at around 10 percent in our uh, uh, 2DS scenario by 2050, uh, and the role of uh, a fuel cell vehicle is is much more uncertain. There are lots of uncertainty. We'll come back to that, I think, later. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for that introduction, sort of for, for giving us the overview. Um, before you put the microphone away, can you just sort of share in one sentence with us? You've been concerning, I mean, every year you sort of do new statistics, you, know, you do new analysis. Have the statistics, have the analysis improved over the last uh, couple of years uh, with the advent of new technologies or technologies that are now on the road? Um, or is the prospect of the two degree goal? has been gone the last five years. No, the, the, pros, the prospect of 2D, 2D yes, is, is, still, is still on the table. It's a question of uh, political decisions. And that's on the agenda of the uh, company uh, negotiation. And our message is that it's more, the more we wait, the more it is difficult. Uh, but it's still possible. And we see some uh, interesting developments when you look at renewables, when you look at electric cars. Uh, then we're not on track because the efforts are not fast enough. Uh, but there is a good hope that we can do it if we want. And we have here the forerunners um, of the diverse uh, technologies, those that um, have already run a couple of miles uh, in the marathon that we need to run. Um, on my very left, so my left winger, of course, uh, from the other point of view, uh, you're the right winger, so <laughs> um, it's not a political uh, description. Uh, Senan, um, you have actually managed in the last couple of years to, together with uh, some other people in Ireland uh, to bring about a system whereby e-vehicles are possible simply because, uh, as you just told me beforehand, every 60 kilometers I could actually uh, replenish the energy supply of my car if I had one. Um, what was necessary uh, in order to sort of, you know, come to such a state of affairs, uh, a laudable one, not the only one in Europe, uh, but certainly a forerunner? Well, I think the first thing to say is that there was a government uh, determination that it should happen. And I think that is probably somebody deciding that it needed to be done. And as you said, that we have now got a basic uh, national charging infrastructure in place. By basic, I mean there's, there is public charging in the cities available. Uh, but in addition to that, every town in Ireland that has a population of 1,500 people has at least two uh, public charging points, each of them capable of supplying up to 22 kilowatts uh, uh, to a car. And then on our motorways and on all our primary routes, we have uh, DC uh, fast charging and increasingly uh, AC fast charging also uh, every 60 kilometers. So that is the system that now for because of austerity and the, the, the recession, and for a variety of other reasons that we may discuss later, uh, we actually have more chargers than cars at, at, at the moment, but we can come back to that. But uh, as you know, Connie, I, I also represent, uh, through Euroelectric, uh, all the utilities of Europe in relation to electric vehicles. And I'd just like to say something there about that and about uh, the electricity system and electric vehicles. Is that the, the, the refueling infrastructure for EVs is largely in place. The fuel, which is the electricity, uh, is in every home and office, uh, in office building, where over 80% of charging will actually be done. Um, all that's needed is the correct plugs. As for the remaining 20%, the public charging, again, the fuel is on virtually every street. There will be a need to install the final item, the charge point. But compared to the investment already made in existing electricity systems, or indeed with the infrastructure for petrol or diesel refueling, 
uh, the cost is relatively small. For instance, if in Germany you were to put a, a fast charger every 60 kilometers on all the motorways and on all the primary routes, you'd need about 900. And even using the very expensive budget price that's to, there today because of lack of volume in the market, that would cost about 44 million uh, euro. So like, they're relatively speaking small numbers. As I said, like in Estonia, you'd need to spend about 6 million and put in about 116, while Estonia already has double that number of fast chargers. In Ireland, you need about 95. We have about 80 of them installed and we're installing the rest at the moment. I'm often asked that if the European electricity system could cope with a large-scale deployment of, of EVs, well, the short answer is yes. If in any country, 100% of the cars were EVs, and I'm not recommending that, I'm just using it to illustrate the point, it would add about 20%. It varies between 25, 15 to 25%, depending on the country, but typically about 20% to the total amount of electricity used in that country. And if you went from zero EVs to 100%, say in 10 years, which is probably a wildly optimistic, if not even an impossible achievement, it would add on average 2% per annum to the annual electricity growth. So that's in the region of business as usual. If all that growth happened at peak times, we could cope, the systems could cope, but it would require additional generation and network assets, putting upward pressure on electricity prices. But if on the other hand, the charging of EVs could be controlled so as to occur during the off-peak periods, then it could be done in every country in Europe without having to build an additional piece of electricity generation or network. And it would, because of better utilization of the existing assets, put downward pressure on electricity prices. There is enough capacity at off-peak times in all European countries to charge all EVs, even if 100% of cars uh, were electric. So the short answer is the electricity system is ready to cope. That is not a barrier to the deployment of, uh, of EVs. So thank you. Thank you very much also for being just in time uh, with, with your statement um, and I knew why I put the two electricity guys uh, on my left side uh, because I could sort of, you know, uh, see the uh, reaction uh, in the eyes and um, I think uh, Winston Churchill already said uh, he only believed in the statistics uh, that he falsified himself so uh, it's not astonishing that you might uh, um, disagree on some of the numbers and some of the percentages um, but before we talk about about, uh, the details of the percentages. Could you just take us along, Gunnar? Um, as an analyst, you looked at the uh, success story in Norway, where the introduction of e-vehicles has taken place, um, um, and there's a market difference between uh, the first introduction, 2008, and today. Um, you looked at the last couple of years. Could you identify for us um, the three most important aspects why suddenly Norwegians, who we think are ecologically minded anyway, but uh, who might actually pick up the idea of electric cars? Did they just do it for ideological reasons or were they prodded? Okay, thank you. Uh, as a, I'm a new Norwegian, <laughs> uh, coming from Sweden one year ago to Norway and becoming a Norwegian, it was surprisingly to see the number of electric vehicles running around in Oslo. Uh, Norway is the country with most electric vehicles per capita in the world. Uh, last month, in April, 20% of the new sales of cars was electric vehicles. This Nissan uh, Leaf and this kind of electric vehicles are on the top sales list of new cars in Norway now. So the question is, of course, why? Uh, why is this? And it, it's a long it's a long history of uh, policy, positive policy towards an electricity vehicle market. 
you have uh, the biggest incentives, I would say, is to ensure that the purchase price of an electric vehicle is more or less the same as the price of a traditional car. So even a positive attitude does not make a difference. You would no, not pay it, more. You, well, I will return to that. Well, you, you would pay a little bit more. But the big thing with this incentive scheme in Norway is that just a rational, boring economist would buy an electric car in Norway. Uh, and the biggest incentives here is, is a VAT is a reduction. It's new VAT on 20%. All, everything else in Norway, but not on the electric vehicle. And you don't have a purchase tax on the electric vehicle. So that, that's the first thing. It's, it's uh, economic available to buy an electric vehicle. It's no problem. The second thing you need to have incentives on is to reduce the barriers, and you have mentioned it. It's the charging stations. I think it's 4,300 charging stations around in Norway today. It's uh, 900 of them in Oslo. It's a lot of them are free charging, free parking. So you just plug in your car in Oslo, charge and park, and then you go back to work again. So, so that's the second area to reduce those barriers for the technology. And uh, the third area, and maybe the picture, if, if it's working in the slide, uh, is that you maybe need to compensate for the disadvantage of electric vehicles. To the, to the, uh, so to the left, it's the market in 2009 approximately. It's a lot of in, uh, Norwegian cars. It looks like that. You needed to be a really environmental friendly person to like that one, to the left, I would say. And that's the second part of the incentives, to make, to compensate for this unsexy uh, appeal of these cars, you need to do something else. And what the Norwegian has done is to access, free access to bus lanes and new tolerance. I would say those are the two biggest uh, incentives. Uh, now you can question these incentives, of course. Now the car market looks like to the, to the right. It's a tremendous development in the design and the appeal of these kind of cars. So that's the three areas. Purchase price, barriers, and then you need to have some for the disadvantage. But that part disappears as the design and the, the, the construction of the vehicles improves. And maybe I should add a fourth one. Yes, yes. It's a small one, but what we find in our research. Yeah. Uh, all the number plates, it's a stupid small thing, but I believe we believe it's important. The number plates of electric vehicles in Norway have the sign EL, electric. Wait, that sounds stupid. But when I walk to the office in Oslo every day, every fifth car, 50 car or something like that, I know, I notice this is an electric car. It's a market out there. It's a lot of other people running these cars. So it's maybe possible for me also as a Swede to think to buy an electric car now. So thank you very much, uh, which um, proves the point that any kind of technology will get traction after the first, the early adapters uh, get above a certain number. And if there is choice, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a, a car person, um, but I noticed, and uh, the red one uh, is, as you explained to me yesterday, uh, the Tesla, which is sort of much talked about. And um, if I read the article correctly, Mercedes-Benz is actually uh, um, using the engine from Tesla for its new limousine. Uh, so it's actually sort of um, uh, technology chairing why well, well reinvent the wheel or the electric motor uh, when you uh, can already uh, have that. Um, I'll uh, turn to, uh, uh, with the remark uh, that we've had here, a representative of BMW uh, yesterday, no, on uh, Tuesday, on Wednesday uh, saying, yes, we can uh, in Germany achieve the one million electric cars by 2020, as our chancellor has promised a couple of years ago. Yes, we can, given the right political circumstances. Um, that was something that you demanded. You pointed out which political circumstances, which sticks and carrots are necessary. And uh, the gentleman uh, uh, to my um, right, Klaus Bonhoff, um, has been trying to convince people of some other means of fueling and uh, of driving cars, uh, which is hydrogen um, and the fuel cell. Um, so how much convincing do you still have to do? And are you a little bit jealous of the uh, successes here of um, the electric vehicle people? Um, 
No, it's not about being jealous. And uh, we actually, although our name sounds a little specific on hydrogen fuel cells, do work on battery electric vehicles as well. Um, NOW is a program management organization that understands itself as being a public-private partnership. So that whole idea of we can only do it together uh, is implemented in our structure and the German government has founded NOW for that purpose to start with on hydrogen and fuel cells but uh, after that adding uh, battery electric uh, mobility to our portfolio as well. Um, the, the topic really is energy and transport and to be more specific the topic is how to decarbonize the transport system. And that is a long-term goal, not only for Germany, but for a lot of countries and governments around the world. Now, governments have set targets uh, in regards to emissions, efficiency, the share of renewables in the transportation sector. Uh, and I think there is an awareness that sustainable mobility is needed. Uh, and we all understand it is possible. Uh, the question is how to get there and how impatient is one uh, in uh, regards to a specific technology. But in the end, it will have to be a mix of various technologies. Um, I would really like to focus in my uh, few points I want to make on road transport. Uh, they make up for 70% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector in Germany and globally the figure is not that much different. Um, road transport, i.e. passenger cars, individual mobility, but also uh, public transport, especially buses in public transport, uh, which in urban areas is indeed uh, an important step moving forward. The German government has set up a mobility and fuel strategy and the new elected government has confirmed the strategy and this actually talks about road transport, air, um, maritime, heavy duty. So it is all covered, but uh, we don't have the time to discuss it all, so let me focus on, on that. The 2020 targets that are existing um, are achievable pretty much by improving incumbent technologies, but also already the OEMs, the manufacturers of vehicles, um, have implemented hybridization. So hybridization today has arrived in the mass market and there's various modes to do so. Um, in the end, we will need full electrified vehicles with batteries and with fuel cells to really come to a fully uh, zero or to a truly zero emission uh, transportation system. Uh, while battery electric vehicles have started commercialization, fuel cell vehicles are in field trial or in demonstration modus or status, uh, but initial sales of fuel cell vehicles will start later this year, starting in California, um, and Germany is working hard to also make sure that we have the right boundary conditions for these vehicles to get into the market, i.e. hydrogen infrastructure uh, needs to be in place. Now, the full decarbonization will only be possible with batteries and fuel cells, not in competition one to the other, but really complementary. I think that is very important to, to highlight. Battery electric vehicles are the most efficient way to drive a car. Um, at the same time, there are limitations in regard to range or size, uh, remember, depending on how you put it, and in recharging times. So they will not fit every customer's use. Uh, so when we talk about long range, when we talk about fast refueling, uh, fuel cell vehicles and hydrogen as a fuel comes into play. And we are today showing uh, in, on public stations that refueling a hydrogen vehicle in three minutes is not only possible, but is safely done. So uh, we've gone a long way in order to get that uh, technology also to the point where we can start commercialization. Now for both, it is true, uh, batteries and fuel cell, that still cost reduction needs to take place. Um, entering the mass market, going down the learning curve with economies of scale is key. There is no magic needed from a technological point of view to start commercialization. I think that is important to highlight. At the same time, we need to continue R&D programs and academia needs to still develop technology. But from an industrialization point of view, uh, we actually can start today and uh, we are starting today. Um, now, the, the critical question, and this really provides you with a very efficient drivetrain, whether it's batteries, whether it's fuel cells. So Improving efficiency in transportation heavily depends on deploying these technologies. And Germany has set a target to not only reach greenhouse gas emission standards, but also to reduce the primary energy consumption in the transportation system. 
minus 10% by 2020, minus 40% by 2050, knowing that at the same time, transportation demand will grow. So efficiency is a key, as is CO2 reduction. Now, CO2 reduction really, in the end, to me, is about the question, how do we get renewable energies into the transportation sector? Um, and again, we need to look at the options that are on the table. We've heard about biofuels. Uh, there may be some applications like uh, airplanes, large airplanes, uh, that for quite a while will need the high energy density of a carbon uh, f uh, liquid fuel. Um, but biofuels can, can play a role here. Uh, the overall potential for biofuels, including the whole discussion on their sustainability, uh, indirect land use, food or fuel, these kind of things, of course limits that potential. So it will not be sufficient to look for biofuel or biomass-based fuels alone, whether it's first or second or third generation, uh, doesn't really matter. Um, in Germany, we have a very specific discussion, as you probably know, about changing our energy system towards a uh, renewably-based energy system, Energiewende, changing the energy system. The public discussion is pretty much focused on the power sector alone, although transportation makes up of, for one-third of our primary energy consumption in Germany. Um, increasing the share of renewables in the power sector of course, eventually leads to system constraints. We have 25% of renewable energy in the power sector today, and we have targets to even increase that. Now, we get into the discussion of how capable is the grid to handle that, how do we get energy from the uh, northern part of Germany where we have offshore wind parks to the southern part of Germany. So expanding the grid is an issue, smart grids is an issue. I believe that hydrogen can and will play a fundamental role in bridging from helping the power sector to increase the share of renewables towards uh, and at the same time using renewable energy for the transportation sector. By producing hydrogen with an electrolyzer, you relieve the grid on the power side. And I explicitly do not talk about storage because we're not talking about then repowering the hydrogen back into the grid. But you have then hydrogen as a renewable fuel that you can put into the transportation system, either using it in normal refinery processes even, or directly then in fuel cell vehicles, which helps quite a lot uh, on the overall efficiency. So uh, this is what we need to move forward with. We need to understand that the energy system is an integrated one. The power sector, the heat sector, and the transportation sector need to look at solutions together. Um, and coming back to um, my, my um, statement at the beginning, this will only be possible and will only happen in public-private partnerships. Yes, we need the right boundary conditions. Uh, just one example from Europe, the Clean Power for Transport initiative is important because it says, for the first time, the European Commission says we need alternative fuels, that's power, that's hydrogen, that's CNG, that's LNG, and the infrastructure for these fuels will not come in a business-as-usual scenario. You will have a second time, I say, so <laughs> keep some of the arguments uh, uh, for uh, later. Um, the gentleman uh, who hasn't talked up to now is uh, quite passionate uh, about energy change, uh, about rethinking, and you've been doing that uh, with the means um, of actually sort of having a show project. Uh, Solar Impulse started like uh, you in the 11th year. Um, you actually managed uh, with a lot of uh, different people working together uh, to establish a solar aeroplane, which was called Solar Impulse One, uh, simply because there's now a second one out. Um, and you did actually manage to prove that it is possible uh, in flying and traversing the US last year or the year before. But uh, why is it so important to show as a single person at the helm of this organization, that it can be done. Um, is solar energy sort of the, um, the little child, the uh, least important child in the array of children of alternative energy sources? Good morning to everybody. Well, wh what are we precisely doing with Solar Impulse? The goal is not just to have a solar airplane flying, because this has been done already 30 years ago. The goal is to demonstrate that you can have a perpetual endurance with no fuel. So this airplane is built 
to take off on its own power, to climb during the day, loading the batteries with the solar cells in order to have enough energy in the batteries to spend the night in the air, to reach the sunrise the next morning, in order to recharge the batteries during the second day flight and continue. So you can have an unlimited endurance, theoretically, because the pilot cannot. When the pilot is too old, you have to land to change the pilot. But the airplane theoretically can stay in the air forever. And what are the challenges? Well, the challenges are exactly the one we have to face in our society. We need to produce our energy in a renewable way. We need to be energy efficient in order to have enough energy coming in a renewable way. You need light structures to be able to reduce what we can call weight, drag, resistance, or whatever. And it needs to be exciting. Because even if you have all the technologies existing in the world, it will not come on the market if people don't want to buy it. So at the end, the challenge we have with our partners was to make this airplane, and it has been made, it has flown through the night, first ever time in history an airplane could fly day and night with no fuel. We crossed Europe. Why that? Well, because the European Commission and European Parliament invited us to Brussels to show what we were able to do with our project. In the moment, that was three years ago, where there was so much resistance in the world of industry for the, against the new rules, new regulations for energy, that the European uh, Parliament wanted to have an incentive showing that it was possible, and Solar Impulse was like the showcase of these new technologies. And then we crossed the United States last year, uh, west uh, to, to east, and had a huge impact in the, in the media. And, and that was something interesting. Only in the English-speaking medias, we got 8.5 billion media impressions, showing that if you have something, something that is exciting, that can catch the awareness of people, the leverage you have to change society is enormous. If we just speak of technologies in an office, in a university, it will never happen on the market. But if you bring people, bring politicians, bring NGOs to be excited about it, then you have a big leverage. So Solar Impulse, in that sense, is not only an airplane that is made to do spectacular flights, but it's mainly, for me, a, a tool to, to change the behavior of the people by showing that incredible things are possible, impossible things even, are possible with these new technologies. And the absolute benefit is, of course, it's zero emissions. So you're already there where we want the rest of society to go. Is it just solar that you see? I mean, because, of course, um, for the last decade, uh, you've been living, breathing alternative energy sources, and you've been looking above and beyond just solar. Um, would you still say that that is the only, the best, but not yet as far as electric vehicles uh, or as hydrogen possibility for the future? Yeah. If we wanted to produce in our transport, own... In transport, I'm sorry. Yeah, in transportation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. If, if we want to produce our own power when we are flying, the only source of energy we have is solar. You cannot have wind energy because if you put a wind turbine on your airplane, you create more resistance and drag <laughs> than, than benefit. You, you, well, it's the only way to do for us. Now, it does not mean that solar energy is the best energy for other users. And it's clear that the future of energy is diversification. And you have at least five sources of energy which can make 20% each in solar, in wind, in geothermia, in biomass, in hydroelectricity. So, depending who is using it, we have enough. Now, the big problem of humankind is that we're always speaking about producing more energy, which actually is not so profitable, 
instead of thinking about energy saving, which is profitable. So what is the metaphor? The metaphor is that human beings are in the bath, in the bathtub, with a leak in the tub. And what do we do? We open the tap to compensate and add more water, more water, more water to keep the level in the bathtub. The first thing we should do is to solve the problem of the leak. Once you fix the leak, you don't need to put all this additional water in the bathtub. And it's exactly the same for energy. We don't want to save energy because we think that it's just a little detail and it won't change anything, but it will change everything. Especially because the technologies, what we call the, the clean technologies, which allow the energy saving, are made out of new products. It's hundreds of new type of products that can open new markets and make profit and create jobs. And I believe this is the place where we have to work the most. Thank you very much, Bertrand. Uh, and I saw Didier uh, breathing heavily and saying, I want to get in. So uh, share with us your thoughts. Yeah, uh, on, two, uh, on two points. First, um, solar, solar energy is an, is, is an option. Um, but, but when we talk about e-mobility, I think the first point I'd like to make is not just about cars. And, and we've said it quite in detail. Uh, there is also an option for two- and three-wheelers. In, 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 in China today, you have 150 million electric bicycles that provide a huge contribution in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, first, air quality, and second, um, CO2 um, abatements. We also need to take a bit the measure of the development of electric cars. There are interesting developments, but still it's an extremely tiny share of the global market. It's 0.04% of the stock in cars. So the increase is, 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 is impressive. It was 50% more in 2013, but what we would need in a 2DS scenario is an increase by 80% per year. So we're not even at the, at the rate. And the number of electric cars now on the road is 350,000, so it's extremely small. That We need to bear that in mind. The second point is that if electric cars have a role to play, it's, very, it's, it's indispensable at the same time to decarbonize electricity generation, and we are not on track from that viewpoint too. So electric vehicles are fine if your electric system is decarbonized. Even if electricity, uh, electric vehicles provide some benefits in terms of, of efficiency, uh, in a 2D scenario, in addition, you need to decarbonize power generation. My last point, uh, which is to, to, to jump on what was just said, is the importance of changing behaviors. And I think different business models would be useful for that. And for instance, car sharing systems um, uh, based on electric vehicles can play a very important role in terms of changing the attitudes of the general public vis-a-vis -vis electric cars. Uh, and, and, and 10% of the uh, car sharing system in the world are based on electric vehicles. Uh, we have in Paris a, a system of car sharing based on electric cars, which is extremely successful. Why? Because it really changes the attitudes uh, also towards, uh, towards electric mobility first and towards uh, what does it mean to own a car. Do you need a car? Do you need the service provided by a car? And, and with car sharing system, you uh, solve a lot of the problems in terms of charging, in terms of uh, uh, the cost of infrastructure. You need to have a strong public-private partnership to put that in place, but it can be a very interesting solution for urban transport. So how you uh, generate electricity is a, an important factor in um, how good, inverted commas, uh, elect the introduction of electric cars is. We're going to hear a little about that from the gentleman on my left, but Klaus wanted to get in on that aspect as well. Yes, and I was actually triggered by Bertrand talking about energy production. There's no such thing as energy production. I mean, that might be the engineer in me, and it's, uh, if you look at the thermodynamics, we can change energy from one state to the other, yeah. but we cannot produce energy. So let's be very cautious with what we have and how we use it. And the only real way is wind and solar, new energy coming onto this planet. So let's be aware of that. The challenge for transportation then is, uh, I mean, floating electrons coming from renewables is one thing, but the challenge really is the energy density to make sure you use those electrons in a given space and volume, uh, which is a car or a vehicle. 
Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, just let uh, me uh, point out to the fact that there are two lovely ladies uh, with microphones. Uh, so whenever you want to chip in, uh, have your comments, uh, have your remarks, have your questions, please do so. Let us know by raising your arm. But um, seeing that we are talking about how uh, energy, how electric energy is generated, uh, Norway is uh, in a beautiful position um, of having a lot of water, uh, a lot of water that sort of falls uh, from high mountains uh, down to uh, sort of uh, almost um, zero uh, height of uh, uh, the um, uh, oceans. So um, that is a inverted commas clean way of producing electricity. Um, is that the best way to produce electric energy? And also, how applicable is that then to other countries? Well, maybe even Sweden. <laughs> Uh, start with Norway, where it's 100% almost hydrogen uh, electricity, hydropower plants. So it's carbon free in that sense, if you, if you just look at Norway as a, as a limited country. Uh, and uh, we start to think in our research that these electric vehicles, maybe that, that's extremely important into the future, and start to calculate back at the envelope what would it mean for the Norwegian electricity market that everything is going electric of the car market? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a rather small share in Norway. We estimate it's around six, seven, eight percent of the electricity consumption would be LA from the transport sector, from the private car transport sector, if everyone is going into the electric market. Uh, so, so that's the narrow Norwegian view, of course, but, but the other part is, of course, we are exporting the energy, so you end up in a European uh, uh, energy market. But as far as I understand it, if you take all those fossil fuel and transfer it into electricity and force it into the European trading scheme with a ceiling of carbon emission uh, quotas, then it has to mean, in the, on the marginal, a zero increase in emissions and only a reduction from this fossil fuel. And you have, you have of course, have a price increase of quotas and so on. But uh, still, it looks for me as a very good idea. Senator. Yeah, I, I would agree that the, if you look at it in terms of marginal cost, it, you can argue that no matter what happens, it's zero. Uh, but most people think that that's a bit of smoke and mirrors and prefer to deal with, uh, uh, with averages. Decarbonizing the electricity system is an essential part of uh, supporting uh, electric vehicles. I think that would be the view of the, 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 the electricity industry. If you generate your electricity entirely from coal, uh, then putting that into an electric car would produce emissions, the, the overall emissions, of the order of 130 grams per kilometre, which can be beaten by, uh, by more efficient uh, petrol or diesel cars. Uh, if you generate your electricity entirely from gas, you're down, uh, from natural gas, you're down at 50 uh, grams per, per kilometre. The, you can pick different countries in Europe and come up with different figures, but if you're to pick the latest figures we have for the average, for the European, and the average means charging somewhat at peak times, somewhat off peak times, then the figure using electricity that's, that's there today or last year would give you about 69 grams per, per kilometer for an electric vehicle. So that's using the European average uh, figure at, uh, at the moment. If on the other hand, if you look at a country like Ireland, where we already have a situation because we don't have enough interconnectors, we have to tell the operators of the wind turbines to furl the blades on days of, at night at low load, we cannot absorb all the electrical energy that the existing wind turbines have. And by 2020, the amount of wind turbines we will have on our system will be double what we have today. Norway, or sorry, not Norway, uh, Denmark has a similar situation, except that they can spill their excess uh, uh, at negative prices. Uh, in, into, uh, into Sweden or Germany, and Portugal also. As, uh, uh, so you can generate, at the moment, we can, if you're charging at night, you can be already charging predominantly 
at, at zero emissions you know, in many countries. Yeah. Thank you, Harold. But um, showcases like yours uh, are always good to energize uh, and to enthuse uh, the public. We've heard uh, in the Norwegian example, it also needs a couple of other carrots for people to actually sort of change their behavior. Um, the insights that you and your team have gained in the last 11 years as far as building, shaping, uh, putting together your airplane. Um, in how far does that then spread further? I mean, I'm now talking about your technologies that you involve, like light as possible, have a light pilot, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but when you then talk about sort of commercialization, you have normal people probably with a, a bit more weight. Um, you have uh, more heavy airplanes. Um, so how does that transfer what you do technologically into, uh, onto a broader base? We are, of course, not stupid enough to say that solar airplanes will carry 200 passengers in 10 years. Um, what we mean is that the technologies we have on board Solar Impulse are so efficient that if they were also used globally by everybody in the world, take that case, we could already today divide the energy consumption of the world by two and produce half of the rest with renewable sources. This is the reality. We have electrical engines of 97% efficiency. The gearbox of our uh, engines are also 97%. When you put them together, it's 94. It's amazing. The type of insulation we have on board is the best insulation ever, thermally speaking. The lighting systems with LED, most efficient. The lightest structure ever. You imagine an airplane that has the size of a jumbo jet and the weight of a car. This is solar impulse with new carbon fiber structures. The type of battery is also, well, yesterday evening I heard somebody had a better battery than ours, but we are still at a really high level of batteries in terms of energy density. All this is a showcase of what can be put on the market for everything, for heating systems, lighting, transportation, and, and so on. But of course, what we need is the general vision. You need a global vision for that. If you focus on energy for houses and you separate it from energy uh, to the transport system, it will never work. It has to be integrated. So I think when we speak of the excess of energy produced by wind turbines, you never have excessive production of electricity if you know how to store it. Yeah. And the storage now is only focused on storing electricity as electricity. It, it's wrong. You should store electricity in heat or cold. The airport of Dallas, you think that Dallas is the world of oil. Well, the airport of Dallas-Fort Worth is the most efficient airport in terms of energy because they buy the cheap electricity at night when nobody wants it, they cool glycol to minus 20, and then during the day, they have the air circulating in their glycol in order to make absolutely cheap air conditioning. And in terms of energy, it is zero CO2 for that air conditioning because the electricity was made anyway by nuclear power. So this is the type of things we have to think about. You can also store electricity in melted salt in order to keep that heat. So depending if it's hot or cold country, hot or cold season, this electricity can be used for other things when it is not used for transportation. But each time we segment and cut all the different sectors, then it's not profitable, then it's not interesting, and then it will not happen. Klaus, um, I stopped you when you were sort of um, breathing through and saying finally the EU has uh, followed uh, uh, on uh, some of the demands that we've made. We've heard uh, from Norway, from Ireland, uh, you need availability, uh, you need a couple of carrots uh, for the audience, uh, we need showcases, we need sort of the brilliant technology. Actually, I have the um, impression but just as an observer, as a journalist, that a lot of things are already out there. 
So where do we get the traction? Where do we bring uh, some of the ideas generated by solar impulses, some of the stuff that's already on the ground, so that we can actually uh, make Didier happy and change his figures uh, that he's got to put into his report and say, yes, we can actually do it by 2050. Okay, I know if you knew the answer to that, you'd probably be a chancellor, but, um, you know, give us, give us an insight. Well, it is a very complex uh, situation, and uh, not only from a technical point of view, but also from a policy and regulatory yeah. point of yeah. view. Uh, if if uh, you allow just one example how stupid we are in using electricity, just to follow up on what was discussed earlier, uh, surplus energy in the German grid is sold to Austria because we cannot store it in Germany. We don't have enough storage capacity for it. So we actually pay Austria to take our power the next day, they sell it back to us at a higher price. Uh, so, just an example, what is happening in the energy market, in the power sector today. So, yes, storage technologies are key. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, integrating transportation into that thought, how can we take renewables to, for other uses, is key. Now, talking about the European Commission, uh, to be honest, uh, I have talked with a lot of experts. I'm in Brussels quite frequently. And I still don't get the full picture. Um, if you look at the transportation sector, of course it starts with, well, how do you regulate the vehicles? It's about CO2 tailpipe emissions. That's fairly easy. Uh, then you get to the point where, okay, the car manufacturers have to you know, come to a certain CO2 fleet emission uh, and they deploy technologies in order to get there. Uh, and then we talk about the renewables or we talk about batteries and we talk about where does the power come from. So the well-to-wheel picture is not included in the thought of, limitate, of limiting uh, CO2 tailpipe emissions. On the fuel side, we have various directives and um, regulatory things. Uh, to me, the most important one, or one of the most important ones uh, that was out there, or is out there, is the Renewable Energy Directive. There is a target to have 10%, a share of 10% renewable energy in the fuel sector by 2020 in Europe. So whoever, whoever sells fuel to the end consumer will have to make sure that 10% of that fuel is based on renewable energy. Uh, and this is a huge opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, the discussion moving forward doesn't necessarily show that we will have targets for 2030, 2040 and so forth, but those 10% alone are a challenge to the oil companies. So and this is where, uh, what I mentioned earlier, hydrogen could play a role next to biomass and others. Um, using renewable hydrogen in the refinery process already offers an opportunity to get renewables into the incumbent system, and that is very important. And the other directive, which is very new, which will be uh, approved uh, very soon, is uh, the Clean Power for Transport uh, Directive, where the European Commission says we will need these alternative fuels, they will not come in business as usual, there is a role for the public side to be played in order to make sure that infrastructures for power, i.e. recharging spots, for hydrogen, hydrogen stations, and CNG and LNG, LNG more for the maritime sector, uh, are coming into, uh, into existence. And each member state in Europe will have to come up with a national implementation plan. There was a discussion of Brussels putting figures out there, telling each country how many stations, how many recharging spots uh, they would need. That's not the way Europe works. Uh, the member states like to have some control of what they're doing by themselves, which is, of course, uh, okay and necessary. And each country has very different energy systems and, and boundary conditions. But the countries will have to come, come up with national implementation plans in regards to how do we make sure that in future we can have a trans-European mobility based on alternative fuels. Thank you very much. Didier already wanted to say something on his own accord, but I would like to sort of add a question that, that you might want to um, consider as well. When we talk about clean power for transport, and uh, maybe not as a program, but as a wish, um, then we don't just need the individual cars, trucks, buses uh, to improve, we need the system to improve. Now, uh, you've mentioned um, one side aspect, which is car sharing of the future. Um, there will be automated systems which will also reduce energy uh, use. 
Um, again, when you look at the world, and again, I ask you as an eagle um, from, from your position of looking at other economies, how much A, awareness, but B, also willingness to put these ideas into practice is there in China, Indonesia, India, um, South America, uh, because that is where we have the up-and-coming middle classes who will say the symbol of our new middle classness is getting a car. Yeah, thanks for the question. Is exactly the point. I, one of the points I wanted to make is that uh, lots of new business model are, are thought about are, are are nascent now. But when we look at at, at the the the. the issue of, 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 of the transition to, uh, to, to a low carbon economy and we compare to what we, what we examined two or three years ago, what has changed is the massive increase of need and demand for mobility from emerging countries and that's based on a very traditional model massively. So on one side you have progress in terms of electric cars, on the other side you have massive increase in demand for mobility from emerging countries. So. As you said, lots, lots of uh, options should be put on the table, car sharing system, but uh, bus transport changing the way transport is organized in large cities, uh, uh, diminishing the demand for uh, uh, transport, moving to new modes. So it's a combination of different actions. The one I wanted to make also, because I think it's very relevant, is the importance of having a system thinking, a global approach to our energy system and not, and because the tradition has been always to think just on the, uh, on the supply side. So in Europe, with high share renewables, people see, okay, we have a problem uh, of intermittency. And, and, and certainly for the future, we need to have this uh, global approach, which means also that we will need to tap different sorts of flexibility options. Uh, Tap more the, the, the demand side, the demand side to uh, response through smart grids and, and using uh, using a cheap and uh, cheap electricity when it is available, um, as it was uh, mentioned. But for that, of course, you need to have the right price signal. So it's also a large change in the way systems are organised. Uh, storage is an option, and I fully agree that thermal storage is probably much more cost effective than direct electric storage under current technology uh, system. And there are a variety of options to, to store uh, uh, heat or heating or cooling heat or uh, or, or cool uh, in the system in the is it it's a good way to use cheap uh, electricity um, flexible generation of course is important and also uh, interconnection and improvement in the grids uh, we always talk about Denmark uh, being uh, have been uh, Denmark has been able to uh, have a high share of, of wind energy but it also because they're integrated in the Nordic uh, North, North pool system where you have also hydro, you have also a nuclear, you have a variety of options and, 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 it, and, and they tend to uh, compensate each other. This is because one, we need also to bear in mind that this transition has to continue to provide security of supply and, and there are some issues now in terms of uh, uh, the uh, continuity of the service provided to the consumer and secondly that it should be done at reasonable prices. Thank you very much. And now, of course, a couple of other things. Uh, Betron and I were just, uh, when we came into the room, saying it's much too cold. I see the lady putting over a, a shawl, which should not be necessary because it's actually quite nice and warm out there. Uh, and uh, us here are probably um, uh, almost uh, okay uh, in the use of uh, cooling um, uh, as compared to some of the... Uh, cooling systems in really, really hot countries. Sen, you're, you're going to take it away in a second, but ladies and gentlemen, we want to have a dialogue with you. So uh, pick up uh, the offer and uh, start talking to us, uh, which can only be done by raising your arm and then getting the microphone. Uh, Sen in first and then the gentleman in the third row. Thanks, Connie. I, I just want to make, make one point. Sometimes there's, there's a tendency to look at the different technologies uh, in a competitive uh, way. The reality is that we have to look at all of these things in a collaborative way. Uh, there's no chance of us picking, saying it's going to be this or it's going to be that. We need to look at, at everything. But in fact, if you look at it in, in terms of the, uh, how, what provides the motion for, for the, the transport system, like is it a combustion engine? or is it an electric motor? And in fact, in what we're looking at here, uh, the plane, it's an electric plane that's happening to get its energy directly or locally, as it were, 
uh, from solar cells and producing its electricity uh, on board. In terms of the hydrogen fuel cell, well, the hydrogen fuel cell is, car is an electric car. It's just that it's getting its, it's using hydrogen as the energy vector. It's taking the hydrogen, putting the hydrogen into the car. The hydrogen, if it's produced in the, in the most energy efficient, probably has been produced uh, by some sort of electrolysis using renewable energy. And you, uh, you're converting it into electricity, back into electricity on board the car. If you're looking at the battery electric vehicle, well then uh, it's clear that that's an electric vehicle. If, if the battery, the battery is, is extremely uh, efficient because of fewer changes of, uh, uh, of state, of energy. But if the battery technology does not develop as some people hope it will, well then the future for all the transport, all the cars, could very well be uh, the, the hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, but even if it doesn't develop in the way we're talking about, there's a still a very good probability that it's not going to develop fast enough to be able to do uh, large trucks, things like that. So you're going to need hydrogen fuel cell. So we need all of the technologies. I think it's just a point to, to, to make. The gentleman in the third row with a microphone. Yes, my name is Perry Ackerman. <clears throat> Patrick Ackerman from Siemens, a large energy generating and uh, transport company. So the topic fits perfectly. Um, Mr. McGrath just mentioned uh, heavy, long distance or trucks. And I would like to take this point and bounce it off to Didier Hussein, who mentioned that transport is, has a large part of the, or the large part of the energy usage in transport is, of course, oil, and that's the vehicle sector. And we talked a lot about, or you on the panel mentioned cars. But you haven't talked that much about freight, which is, of course, another large part of the mm -hmm. transportation sector. Mm -hmm. So the question to Didier is, how much do you see that freight either shifting to rail or becoming using alternative fuels or even electricity uh, in your scenarios in the recent report that you launched just last week? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that facet, which we had spared out up to now. Um, any other questions right at the moment? In that case, we can't collect. We have this one question, Didier. Uh, yes, thank you. We, we looked into, into the importance of also uh, freight transport in the, in the recent ETP report and, and, and explained that, that there is a role for electrifying freight transport through train, so using more railways, but also having uh, uh, um, electrifying lines for trucks for key transit uh, lines. Uh, it can be also an option uh, where you could use uh, uh, electricity for um, for freight, uh, for trucks uh, through uh, electric trucks or electrified lines uh, along uh, highways for key uh, routes. I just wanted to know uh, from Gunnar, um, we have said or you have uh, shared with us that there were a couple of carrots why people are sort of uh, now uh, jumping on the idea of having an electric car and yesterday you actually shared with me it might not be the first car that they would choose as an electric car but the second car and gain all these benefits like don't pay tolls, um, don't pay VAT, um, have charging uh, stations everywhere as soon as you get into the big cities. Um, one of your ministers has already said that cannot go on forever. We cannot sort of, you know, continue giving these incentives forever. Um, what is your prediction? What is maybe your analysis when those perks um, are no longer there? Will the idea, will the technology have gained that much traction that people will do it anyway, uh, even if they do Will, or will they have to, to pay a little bit of uh, the toll routes uh, afterwards? Yes, yeah, it's of course the future. It's not sustainable with, with all of the incentives. And uh, the politicians have promised to keep the economic incentives until 2017. And then it's a question. But the most, the most problematic incentive is the, the two other things, the bus lane mm -hmm. and the free route tolls. If you take a map of, the, of the, who is owning the, the electric vehicle in Norway, you suddenly notice that 
where you have advantage of a bus line, especially into Oslo, there where you're selling a lot of electric vehicles, uh, where you have the advantage of not paying at all, especially uh, expensive subsea tunnels, 2,500 year, year, euros a year for a person, out in a small island, they are buying electric vehicles. And in some of the small islands, you have eight, nine, ten percent of the vehicle fleet is going electric. And that means for the root toll company, it's ten, eight percent reduction in revenues. So uh, those two are the most difficult. And I believe, and we see that the market is more and more competitive and more and more people are buying electric vehicles also where you can't use the incentives of the root hall and the incentive of public transport. So it's possible that those two incentives can go away and you still will have a growing market. But we don't believe that you can take away the economic incentives that make the purchase price similar. So then you have to wait for the market to reduce the production cost of the electric vehicles. You, you still need to them have these incentives for the price, but you probably can take away the other two things. Could you do us a favor, take away the earphones? Because they are sort of uh, giving Let's an electronic in interference. Um, when we talk about all of this, talking about the new energy future, and just for the sake of our discussions, I, I will put a bracket around the new, because we are not that new anymore. Um, we, we have already started the walk um, of the marathon. We're a couple of kilometers ahead, which makes it difficult to sell all these things um, with a lot of enthusiasm. Um, we see it in the um, climate uh, discussions internationally. Uh, people are much more reluctant than, let's say, 10 years ago when there was sort of, you know, this great oomph forward. So the, the, the question that I'm asking now is, is really in the direction uh, where, where Bernard is going, uh, uh, Bernard is going. Uh, I'm sorry, Bertrand. So sorry. Um, I, w I was in different thoughts. Um, the question is not just the behavioral change, not just the thought change, but how do we keep up the energy, our own personal energy, to bring about and make it work, everything that's already out there, without the perks? Senan, you, you have been on the road quite a bit. You've probably had to knock on many, many doors to get to the stage where you are now. Um, and that's wonderful, but the international figures show it's just a touch. Yeah, I, I think that the, uh, I think people who, who favor electric vehicles and the people who have been pushing the, uh, the electric and, and alternative fuels tend to be people like myself who are fundamentally engineers. I, I think most of us, uh, underestimated the, the realities of marketing a consumer product uh, such as a car. I mean, people buy cars for all sorts of different reasons. What, from our experience, for that reducing the price of the, the forecourt price uh, of the car uh, is important. But what that does is that it opens up a larger potential market. There are more people prepared to buy a car at 20,000 euro than there are at 30,000 euro. However, of itself, it still doesn't produce a reason to buy. Customer still has to. And on top of that thing that I mentioned to you yesterday also, in Ireland, which is a small market, we have two million cars on the road. Uh, even in the depth, at the depth of the recession, we still have 250 different models of car on sale every year. So you arrive with one model of car, which is all we have had for a couple of years, the Nissan Leaf. And the top selling car in, in Ireland, and the figures are similar in other countries, but I don't have the exact figures. 
5% of the market is taken by the top selling car, which happens to be a, a Volkswagen Golf uh, at the moment. So you come along with your one electric model and you're competing with 250 other models. You are not going to get huge market share as a result of just having one model. The cost you need to meet customer demand, which is for multiple range people, there will be some people, they're probably very good people, but they will never be seen dead in a Nissan car. Some people will buy nothing other than a Mercedes, and for all sorts of different personal reasons. And therefore, we are not going to get large scale penetration until the variety of cars, of electric cars, increases a lot more significantly uh, th uh, than it is at the moment. And therefore, we have to realize that if you look at the figures in America, the, ele the electric car, the battery electric car, after two years, was about, is about 50% farther down the road than the hybrid car was two years after it was launched. Still, the figures are less than people were hoping for because everybody was over-optimistic. I think we should see... We're in this for the long haul. 2020 is not the end of the road. It's merely nothing more than a staging post. 2050 probably isn't even the, the, the end of the journey, but it's as far ahead as we can probably look at the moment. Gonna, um, you actually showed the variety of cars uh, that are now available. So it's not just the Leaf, but um, uh, many more. So people actually have that choice in, in Norway. Um, yeah, but what does that mean? Yeah, it has been a tremendous development the last years. And it means that you find electric choice in all of the segments. You can think of buying the latest Porsche or electric Tesla. You can think of buying uh, fossil fuel Golf or electric Golf and so on, all down to the, to the simplest, uh, lowest segment of cars. So that's very important that penetration of the market is in all segments going for electric vehicles now. And yet the um, new arrival of, let's say, the BMW uh, electric car that we can see out there, and, and uh, there might be Mercedes, there might be other producers, does not have the same effect than uh, when Apple launches its uh, latest iPhone, even though the incremental changes are <laughs> maybe much less. So um, what is missing in, in, in our enthusiasm in um, sort of, you know, getting it mainstream? That's the point. Um, I, yes, <laughs> okay, I think we have takers of that question. Bertrand uh, first, uh, uh, Klaus and Didier Arno uh, also wants to. When the Americans went on the moon 45 years ago, they had fuel cells to produce their electricity. So you're absolutely right in saying it's not new. And what we need to put it on a massive way on the market, yeah. I believe, is political decisions. Mm -hmm. You told very well what are the incentives in Norway. But we have no idea what will be the incentive in Switzerland, France or Germany or any other country in Europe for people who buy an electrical car. So why would a car producer built and put on the market an electrical car. He doesn't know what will be the help from the political world. So what we need now is a very clear legal frame. And I give you an example. When I was a kid, all the families of the neighborhood took the garbage once every two or three days, put it in the car, bring it to the forest and throw it in the forest. That was in Switzerland 45, 48 years ago. <laughs> and it was the way to do it. It was legal. Why did this dirty practice disappear? Only because it was prohibited. Everybody knew it was bad for nature, but everybody did it. When it was prohibited from one day to another, there was a system of collecting the garbage, centralized, uh, recycling or burning or whatever. It's exactly what we have to do now for energy consumption. The day that the governments will give, a, will give a clear message, this is the goal to reach, and it has to be reached soon, 
you will see all the car producers, the truck producers, everybody just being aligned with this goal and bring it on the market. So we can speak as much as we want. If the political don't decide to do something, it will never happen. Didi, if you can hold on one second, um, I think Klaus would be a, a good person to uh, have after that. I mean, we've had a uh, political change um, recently, as far as energy policies are concerned, um, just because some outside happening, Fukushima. Um, we have started our Energiewende, um, and I, I don't want to exaggerate uh, or be Germany-centric, but the world is looking at us, how are we going to do it? Some of, uh, <laughs> some of the countries say they're mad, uh, some other countries say that's fine, because economically we're going to overtake, um, and yet we're committed. Uh, why is that not taking place uh, in the area of transportation? as yet, maybe. Well, for one, the Energiewende has even started earlier, but the uh, Fukushima made it obvious uh, and really led to the majority of our population agreeing to, yes, we need to change. Uh, although, I, I must admit, one of the points I wanted to make is the broader population probably doesn't even know we have a problem. That's does not know does we not have... know we have a problem they do hear about two degrees in climate change but me personally do i have a problem with my mobility pattern no i'm quite comfortable with what i'm doing i can afford it so really the question is the individual buyer's decision mm -hmm. how is that triggered mm -hmm. yeah. now that's where politics come in they need to understand we have a problem mm -hmm. and as society we understand we need to do something, but as individuals, we are, we are not willing to act accordingly. We've done a survey which uh, says that a average car buyer in Germany uh, would like to be green, uh, but is not willing to pay more than maybe two, three thousand euros on top of a normal vehicle. Mm -hmm. So that does play a major role. Um, changing the energy system will not happen overnight. Uh, and I completely agree, it will have to be politics putting out targets. I don't think politics should choose technologies, but they need to set the right target. Talking about transportation, personally, I wish we would very early on have a binding target for CO2 fleet emissions, if that's the right measure, but I think it is for cars, for 2030. If we today say Forget about 95 in 2021, let's do whatever the figure is, 50 grams CO2 per kilometer in 2030. That would give all of the manufacturers enough time to react. The technologies are available, we do prove that in today's uh, early commercialization demonstration uh, activities. Uh, it gives us enough time to manage infrastructure for this. We know it can work and we will find investment for it. Of course, changing the, energy, changing the energy system does mean you have to carefully balance how do you manage existing investment in the incumbent technology versus how do you trigger investment into new technologies. And a long-term stability, policy stability, to me, is really the key. Did you? Um, yes, I, I, I fully agree with that. I think, but I don't think we should. We can just rely on, on, on legislation, obligation, mandates. Because when you talk about transport, you t talk about millions of individual decisions of consumers that have a strong desire for mobility, and and and, uh, and I think under political conditions uh, we have to live with that. And I think, I think that's important. But there, there is a way to introduce new technology, the development of new, de the wide deployment of technologies that. Exist exist is I think it's through an interaction of uh, policy po policy incentives technology progress and market conditions and it's been the case for all new technologies that have suddenly emerged including shale gas shale gas didn't come out of the blue they had been encouraged by a lot of R&D and public R&D before and uh, some people actually regret that because they say uh, alternative energy sources are now sort of pushed back because people re lean back and say yeah, we've got not that much in the US because they maintain support to to, to renewables and and, and but and also talking about renewables, this is a success story, and, and, and because renewables are really on track for a 2DS scenario at global level. Why? Because there has been a combination of policy incentives, 
uh, technology progress with the, for instance, solar uh, system uh, costs being cut by, by more than three over the last five to six years, uh, thanks to lower cost of panels and, and, and market incentives with the high cost of alternatives. Now you see a lot of emerging countries moving to uh, renewables without having to go through the learning curve that has been experienced by European countries or, or the US before. So I think it could be the same for electric vehicles. It's a combination of incentives in particular to get out of the, uh, um, the, the chicken and egg problem or should the infrastructure start to be put in place and under use or should they, uh, without a large electric uh, vehicle car fleet or should it be the opposite? So you need a strong policy framework and incentive. At the same time, the costs need to be cut and there is a huge progress that can be done on the technology side in terms of the cost of batteries and cost of electric vehicles. And a third element would be the market conditions. I think if you see higher oil prices uh, in the coming years, which is uh, pretty likely, you will have a strong uh, incentive for consumers to look more carefully at uh, electric options. Can I just ask one, one quick um, question before I do the final round uh, with all of you? Um, uh, we've heard about a lot of incentives, uh, sort of carrots. Um, we've had a number of uh, points uh, where traffic had to be closed down because of the um, uh, effects uh, it had. Paris last year, uh, we uh, all know the pictures of Beijing uh, and who's ever been there was uh, happy to actually see, see a little bit of blue sky. Um, so how much of the sticks do we need as populations in order to change, i.e. how many disasters do we have to incur uh, before we actually change our attitudes? No, that's a tough question. I think there is more and more realization of the impacts of climate change through extreme weather events, so it, 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 I think it brings uh, back. I was it, just it talking about transport and cities and, and, and cars. I mean, you know, really, Paris, um, too much ozone. Uh, Beijing, I can't breathe, I get ill. Um, so, so how much of that do we need until we actually grab the opportunities that are already out there for the transport system. I'm not sure that, that, that this sort of event would be sufficient to, or to see all uh, people change their, 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 their way of life overnight. Uh, but what they need to have is more options. And I mentioned the car sharing system in Paris. I think it's, it's one of the options, more uh, improvement in public transport. At the end of the day, public transport for cities is, is a key option. And we need to bear in mind that in the, in, in, by 2050, we will have 70 people of world population in big cities. So we need really to look at the transport system in big cities where you we shouldn't rely so much on, on, on private car ownership. Thank you very much, Ndidi. I'm sorry I put you on the spot quite obviously. Last uh, round, and you can uh, bring your thought into that. Um, I, I've, uh, I've done it uh, in, in a number of other panels. In five years' time, Ireland will, Europe will be as far as cleaner energy for transport is concerned. We will definitely be farther along the road but we will not be where we thought we would have been five years ago. It's a slower process than we thought. Sweden and Norway will be in five years' time. I'm more optimistic. I think uh, it will, the, the electric vehicle will take off in Norway. It will be uh, the first choice of a car. I think we need to start to think about this uh, with the freight transport, electric freight transport. That we haven't started, so it has started to discuss electric freight transport. Klaus, in five years' time. I hope that we will have a policy framework in place that really combines the energy system as a whole, which includes clear targets for the share of renewables. Didier, in five years' time. Uh, we need a strong, uh, strong change in, in policy making and, 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 uh, and, and, and strong decision and, uh, at political level to, to speed up the process. And last but not least, um, and now you can already sort of give an, a philosophical uh, indication of what may come later on uh, in the plenary. Bertrand, in five years' time, first of all, you will have circumnavigated the world. Well, hopefully, <laughs> yeah, because the, the goal is to fly next year around the world with Solar Impulse 2. Well, in five years' time, you will have pioneers who will have gone much further than what we think in terms of 
electrical cars, in terms of electrical airplanes. You will have in five years' time probably airplanes flying with four people on board, electrical, maybe not solar, but you will plug them on the grid, and you will fly with no noise around airports on Sunday afternoon, everybody will be happy. You, you will always have pioneers who will make impossible things. Now the problem is that you will always have politicians who will not be even able to make the possible things. And this is why I'm not so optimistic for the collectivity. I'm optimistic for the individual evolution, not so much for the collective evolution. And maybe we will need very, very big crises to have governments react on a global scale. And this is a pity, because we see the problem coming, we see governments not reacting, you see individuals pulling the alarm, and nothing happens. So we all need to push the governments to take the responsibilities we need. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that in five years' time we will still work for a better alternative energy future in the transport system, but also for the system as a whole, simply because we want to survive and we want our children to have a place on this earth in which it is worthwhile living. And that is not differentiated differentiate between those that are suffering from the climate change and don't have a place to live anymore, and those uh, few selected that live on high ground and uh, are rich enough uh, to afford all the technologies. Okay, fine. Um, this was almost philosophical. Thank you so much to my panel now. And I need a little bit of a round of applause.